Welcome. Uh, we are beginning a new series this morning. Uh, the series is entitled Reset. And uh, I was thinking about this idea um, partly because of one of my jobs in my home, and that is to be the IT technical support person in my home. Um, uh, one of the things that happens periodically in my house is people come to me and say, uh, this phone isn't working, this iPad isn't working, the Wi-Fi router isn't working, and my amazing training and solution to all of these problems is, why don't you just reset the machine and see if that helps? Usually it does, by the way, uh, for those of you that are having trouble with your technical stuff, just try turning it off and turning it back on, and oftentimes that solves the problem. The thing is, is that all of us need a reset at some point. In fact, uh, yesterday I was driving home from uh, the Monterey Carmel area because I was uh, looking at uh, my, my ring camera and saw that there was six inches of water on the side of my house. And I'd realized that that would be a problem if I didn't get to it. And so I drove home in order to clean it out. And as I was working in the rain for about three and a half hours yesterday, pushing water and then having it washed back towards me and pushing water and having it washed back towards me, as many of you probably had to do as well, I realized that there are some drains that would be helpful if they cleared. And if those drains cleared, then the water would go away. And sometimes our lives are the same way. This is my epiphany while I'm pushing water in the rain yesterday. <laughs> that sometimes the, the drain of our life gets a little clogged. It gets a little full. Um, it doesn't allow the water to flow properly. And a good reset, a good cleansing of the system, a good, uh, a good uh, uh, just kind of start over will allow that to flow. And so I'm uh, bringing this series to you in the month of January only. Then we're going to get back into the book of Hebrews and we'll finish Hebrews uh, in February and March. But, uh, but for the month of January, I want to talk about this idea of a reset. And yes, it has to do kind of around the New Year's time, um, but it also is something that I think that God wants to do in us because God is in the business of resetting. You realize that? God does new things. In fact, in Isaiah chapter 43, one of my favorite verses, it says, God says, behold, I am doing a new thing. Now it springs forth. Do you not perceive it? I am making a way in the wilderness and I am making rivers in the desert. Well, we had some dry riverbeds yesterday that now have rivers in them. And uh, some of you that live near creeks saw that in a very real way yesterday. God has a way of starting something new, of beginning something new. And maybe for you, as you kind of think about 2023, it's good for you to think about what new thing is God going to do this year? Because you may be anxious to turn the page on 2022, or you may be wishing that 2022 was going on for a while because it was a really good year for you. That's the interesting thing about being together in a room with a couple hundred people is that all of us have different life experiences. For some of us, it was a great year. And for others of us, it was a year that we desperately want to get away from. But maybe you're a New Year's resolution person. Anybody in the room like to make the resolutions? Only two. Okay. Three. Amen. Do I have four? Anywhere. All right. Good. All right. Hey, there they are. Good. Um, in 2022, um, these were the common resolutions that people were making. So maybe, maybe you're a resolution person. Maybe you're looking for something to do. I resolve that in 2023, this is going to happen for me. This is how people tended to think about resolutions in 2022. Guess what the number one resolution was? Anybody? Uh, not lose weight, but exercise more. <laughs> Exercise more, 48% of people said they want to exercise more. 44% of people said, I want to eat healthier. Are you noticing a theme? <laughs> yes, because number three was lose weight. That's right. All of these resolutions that people have, thinking about what do I want to do to improve myself? Well, if I exercise more, I eat healthier, and I lose weight, the majority of people said those are going to be my main resolutions. But there was also some others. The fourth one uh, was that I want to spend more time with friends. 
I want to spend more time with friends in 2022. This is, this is not a church survey. This is not something that we did here. This is not uh, a pew survey. This is, this is just out in the public. What are people hoping to see happen in this last year? And one of the things that people recognize is that I need to spend more time with friends. Now, this may be a post-pandemic resolution. Um, I, I was locked up for a long time, and I need to be connecting with people. But We believe at Redwood Chapel that that's a pretty good thing to be thinking about as well, to be connecting relationally with people, to be connected to other people. And we're going to actually talk a lot about that in this Reset series, about how we can be doing that. Some people made a resolution, I need to spend less money. (laughs) Um, I'm outspending my earning. Uh, By the way, that's not a good formula for a long-term investment. Um, you don't want to be outspending your earning. And so maybe you just need to spend less money. Other people said, I need to reduce my social media. Can I get an amen, please? Um, I think, I think it would be really good if our country just kind of said no to social media. Even though I like to use it and I like to follow it, and I do, I, I find myself getting caught in that rabbit hole. But I'll tell you, it can be a dangerous rabbit hole sometimes because it becomes this This vortex of noise, and you don't always know where the voices are coming from and whose opinions they are and what's going on, and it's not face-to-face, it's not real, it's just this this thing that's out there, this noise that's kind of constant in our life. Other people, the last one I'll I'll mention, some people said, I want to reduce my stress at work. I want to reduce my stress at work. Actually, there was one more beyond that, and that was I want to, I think I want to quit smoking. (laughs) I want to quit smoking. Um... You thought about resolutions? Maybe some of these resonate with you. Uh, A lot of them have to do with getting healthier. A lot of them have to do with being a better person, being a healthier person, being a better version of yourself. Well, my question as we kind of think about this series is what if instead of making resolutions that we're going to not do by Thursday anyway, (laughs) I mean, if I'm being honest, right? Those of you that are on your new workout plan, I give you till about Thursday. That's me cheering you on, by the way. If I wasn't cheering you on, I'd say Tuesday. But I I understand reality, too. But what if instead of making all these resolutions, we committed, committed to letting God reset our relationship with him to start the year? What if we said, God, I want to be open before you. I want you to do something in me. I'm, I don't want to be the one to drive the agenda of my day or of my year or my month or my week or whatever. Rather, I would rather, God, that you begin to work some sort of a resetting process in my life. Now, I'm not saying necessarily that you need to go back to the very beginning of your faith and unlearn all of the lessons that God has taught you because those lessons that God has taught you through the years are what has helped to form you into the person that you are. But I do think that each of us could probably benefit from just allowing our lives to be open before God, to come before him humbly, to come before him expectantly, to come before him freshly and just say, God, what do you have in store for me, not what is my agenda that I want you to do? This was helpful for me to think through, and I hope that it will be helpful for you as well. Um, and so this morning, I want to I start this series by talking about what does a reset of our souls look like? What would it look like if our soul had a reset button? And all of the things that clutter us, all the things that are in our lives, all the things that are going on, we were able to step back, hit the reset button, and we said, God, I want my soul, the innermost part of who I am, to be open and bare before you so that you can do something in me. What would it look like if God had the freedom to do that in our life? What would it look like if we gave him permission to do that? What would we need to do? What would God need to do? What would this even look like. And so for this morning, I want to spend some time talking about this idea of resetting our souls. And to do that, um, I want to um, talk about uh, the ministry of Jesus and in particular the ministry of John the Baptist. Because in all four Gospels, before you ever hear from Jesus, you hear preaching from Jesus, in all four Gospels, you're introduced to another guy who happens to be Jesus' cousin who's known as John the Baptist. 
And um, John the Baptist has a message that he is preaching as well. And the main theme of John's message is repent. Repent. Um, And usually when we think of repentance, at least when I do, I think of I need to stop doing something that I'm currently doing. Anybody else think that way about the word repentance? I need to stop doing what I'm doing. And then uh, I think the the language that, that I have learned is I need to turn around and begin to move in a different direction. That's repentance. It's stopping and then turning. But John's the description of repentance has more beyond just stopping something. It does have this aspect of doing something. There is an activity to it. There is a repentance, and then there's a message that goes with it. So if you have your Bible, turn to Luke chapter 3 with me. Luke chapter 3, I'm going to highlight a couple of verses in Luke chapter 3 where we're looking at John the Baptist preaching in preparation for Jesus' ministry. Okay? These are John the Baptist's words that we're going to be looking at. And so you'll see it on the screen behind me if you don't have a Bible in front of you. This is in the English Standard Version, which is also in the pew rack uh, of the Bibles uh, that are in the, excuse me, the rack, um, the Bibles that are in the pew rack in front of you. If you are looking in those Bibles, you'll find this passage on page 858. 858, Luke chapter 3, verses 7 through 9. Look at it with me. It says, this is John the Baptist. He, John the Baptist, said therefore to the crowds that came out to be baptized by him, you brood of vipers. Now, let's just stop there for a second. (laughs) This is not how I typically address the congregation that comes to hear the preaching. Um, But John is calling people to something, and there's there's a problem that he's addressing. And so he, he sees the people that are coming to him to be baptized. There is not any sort of prologue here that tells us how long John has been preaching, what kind of a crowd he is gathering. But as people are coming to him, his announcement back to them is, you brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath that is to come? Then it says, Bear fruits in keeping with repentance, and do not begin to say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father. In other words, he says, look, you guys, you you have a sin issue, and who told you about this need for repentance? Here's what you need to do. You need to bear fruit that matches the repentance that is that you're saying is necessary. You need to, there needs to be an action that is associated with your repentance. And here's what you need to not do. Don't say to yourselves, well, I'm attached to Abraham. I'm I'm connected to Abraham. My history, my legacy, my nationality, my ethnicity, I'm connected to Abraham. He says, don't say that you have Abraham as your father, for I tell you, God is able from these stones to raise up children for Abraham. Don't, Don't think you're so good because of your legacy, because of your history, because of your family line. If if I needed to, if God needed to, he would turn these stones into the children of Abraham. And then he says this, even now, the ax is laid to the root of the trees for every tree, therefore, that does not bear good fruit, it's cut down and it's thrown into the fire. You say, Jeff, what does this have to do with resetting our souls? Well, here's here's what I want us to lean into this morning. Uh, That language that I highlighted um, there, I think it's in verse 8, has this idea of bearing fruit in keeping with repentance. And the language of the Bible, um, one of the primary biblical Uh, pieces of imagery that we see to describe a, a healthy spiritual life is that of a tree that is bearing fruit. Um, Repent, he says, but, but make sure that you are bearing fruit that matches your repentance. Um, You're going in the wrong direction and you need to turn. Your soul needs a reset But as you reset, you need to make sure that you're actually bearing fruit. 
in a way that is beneficial, that matches your repentance. And so this idea of of biblical imagery that describes what does healthy spirituality look like. Oftentimes in the scripture, it's associated with this idea of bearing fruit. Now, if that's true, and we need to know what it looks like to bear fruit in keeping with our repentance, then the question that I would want to know is how? How do I do that? How do I bear fruit in keeping with my repentance? And if you read on in this passage, that's exactly the response of the people. In fact, in verse 10, you see up here on the screen, it says the crowds came to him and asked him, well, then what should we do? And then in verse 12, you read about the tax collectors who also come to him to be baptized, and they say to him, teacher, what should we do? And then in verse 14, you see the exact same question. Now it's soldiers who are coming to him, and they're asking the same question, what shall we do? And my guess is, if I were to tell you, hey, your repentance needs to bear fruit, then a logical question that you would want to ask me is, well, what in the world does that look like? How do I do that? How do I bear fruit? How does my repentance bear fruit? What does it look like for that to be true? And if this biblical imagery of spiritual health is a life that bears fruit, a tree that bears good fruit, then what does that look like? And and I think the best passage of Scripture, one of the best passages of Scripture that helps us to understand this is John chapter 15. I'm going to put it here on the screen for you. You may be familiar with this text, but Jesus is speaking to his disciples. This is late in his ministry. Uh, The cross is near. It's approaching. He's spending time with his disciples in a long, prolonged conversation that begins in John chapter 15 and goes all the way up until they leave to go to the Garden of Gethsemane before his crucifixion. And Jesus says these words in John chapter 15, verses 1 through 5. He says, I am the true vine. And my father is the vine dresser, the one who cares for the vine. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes so that it can bear even more fruit. And he says, already you are clean because of the word that I've spoken to you. So, verse 4, abide in me. And I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. And then verse 5, I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. Okay, so follow, follow the train of my thought anyway. The people are coming to hear John preach. John says, hey, you don't need to hold on to your history. But that's not what's going to save you. What's going to save you is your repentance. You're changing your behavior and having a repentance that has fruit that is associated with it. Your life needs to bear fruit. And Jesus says later, the way in which your life bears fruit is if it abides in me. Now, we don't use the word abide very often. So what does that word even mean? It means stay connected to me. Stay connected to Jesus. In fact, our lives bear fruit when we are connected to Jesus, abiding with him, remaining with him, staying connected to him, being close to him. You see, so often we think about, at least I think we think about, the religion in such a way as uh, what do I need to do in order to earn God's favor? What do I need to do in order to please God? And the thing that God wants to say to you is it's not about all the things that you think you need to do. It's about what Jesus has already done for you, and all you need to do is connect to him. And if you can connect to him, he will abide in you, and something will happen. Your life will change. When you are connected to Jesus... Your life will change, and it will begin to bear fruit. Now, again, 
This language of bearing fruit begs the question, what does that even mean? look like? What should I be anticipating if I'm connected to Jesus in such a way that I'm bearing fruit? And here we jump forward to Paul in Galatians chapter 5, where he says, here's what the fruit of the Spirit looks like. The fruit of the Spirit, Paul says, is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control, against these things there is no law. All right. So, how do I bear fruit in keeping with repentance? Not according to what I do, but according to what Jesus does in me. When I am connected to him, he will begin to bring about change. And so watch what happens when you go back into John's message in Luke chapter 3. Because those three different groups of people that asked John, what do I need to do? The, the crowds, the, the tax collectors, and the soldiers, John answers each one of those specifically. And so look at what he says going back into Luke chapter 3 verse 10. When the crowds asked him, what then shall we do? He answered them, whoever has two tunics is to share with him who has none. And whoever has food is to do likewise. Now, if you read that passage and you think, okay, the way that I make God happy is by giving people stuff, you're missing the point. You don't make God happy by giving people stuff. You share what you have because God is already at work in you. You become a different person. You bear fruit. It's not a religious checklist that I have to begin to now all of a sudden be more generous. No, it's a generosity that flows from my connection to the vine. That that's who Jesus is. That's what fruit of the Spirit looks like. And so whoever has two tunics is to share them with those who has none. Whoever has food is to do likewise. Here's another way to say that. What do I need to do? The crowd comes and asks John the Baptist. John says, you need to learn how to love people. You need to learn what love really looks like. And love will be demonstrated when you are connected to Jesus. Because being connected to Jesus produces love. How will it look when you're connected to Jesus? It means that you will be a person who has joy. You won't be so emburdened. Why do we not share what we have? Because we hold on to it too tightly for ourselves, right? I mean, we tend to be people who don't, don't want to joyfully give to other people because we think, well, they really haven't deserved it anyway. They're going to waste it. They're not going to appreciate my hard work. They're not going to appreciate my gift. No, there is joy in giving to other people. And that joy in sharing what you have is a result of being connected to Jesus. I don't give out of obligation. I give joyfully because of what God is doing in me, because I'm connected to him. And so giving to somebody who has none or to someone who has no food, to do, to do likewise, to give to them, that's a response to being connected to the vine. That's a, that's a reset of your soul. I see the need and I meet the need on the basis of that person's need because Jesus is changing me, not because I'm trying to earn God's favor. The motivation behind these things is hugely important. Why do I do the things that I do? Is it because I want God to be pleased with me or is it because I want to love him by being connected to him? So then the tax collectors come to him and they come to be baptized and they say to him, teacher, what should we do? And he says to them, collect no more than you are authorized to do. Be kind. <laughs> the fruit of the spirit is kindness. Kindness. Be kind to other people. Don't, don't, don't embezzle. That's what you should do. 
That's what the fruit of repentance looks like for you. It means not taking advantage of people, being gentle with people, having self-control, not wanting only to fill up your money, but, but being able to treat people well. The soldiers come to him and they say, what should we do? And he says, don't extort money from anyone by threats or by false accusation. Rather, be content with your, with your wages. Be kind to people. Be gentle with people. You see, the, the, the question that is being asked of John the Baptist is, what does this look like? What does the fruit of my repentance look like? And the answer is love, joy, peace, patience with people, kindness towards other people, goodness towards people, self-control, faithfulness. Like These are the fruits of what it means to be connected to Jesus. And so if that's true, and, and if, that, if that is the evidence then of what it means to actually be connected with Jesus, then here's the question that I think you need to wrestle with today. And I say you to each individual that's here or that's watching online. Each of us needs to come to a place where we say, if I were to come before God and say, God, I want to allow you to reset my soul this year, to reset my life in some way, what aspect of fruit is missing from your life? Where do you need to grow? Where do you need to have evidence of God's fruit, the Holy Spirit's fruit in your life? Do you need to be a person who loves better. What is the greatest commandment? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. I need to grow as somebody who loves other people. I'm judgmental. I'm harsh. I have a quick temper and anger towards other people. I need to grow in my ability to love. Maybe you need to grow in your joyfulness. You know, one thing that's hard for me when I stand up here is I don't see a lot of smiles sometimes. And that's, that's fine. You're not in a, I'm not telling jokes. I'm not expecting you to be laughing all of a sudden. But there is sometimes a sense of dourness on the face of people that makes you go, is there any joy in there? Are you a joyful person? Is the joy of the Lord your strength today? Did you wake up and recognize that the life that you have today was given to you by God and say, today is the day that the Lord has made. I'm going to choose to rejoice in this day and be glad in it. Do you, do you wake up that way? Do you need more joy in your life? Do you need, do you need to get out of this Oh, everything's horrible. Oh, every, everything's better in Idaho or whatever. <laughs> Do you need to let go of that? Because it's not better in Idaho. I love Idaho. I love my friends in Idaho. But Texas or Idaho or Hawaii or the Netherlands or South America, it's not better there. What you need is joy where you are. You need to wake up and recognize God gave me today and I can have joy today. I can walk across the street to a campus that is dark and I can be joy on that campus. I can go to a workplace where I don't agree with something that they're doing, a policy that they have, and I can bring joy in that situation. That's the fruit of the Spirit. It's not an obligation to check some boxes. It's in a reality that you live according to the connection that you have to the Savior. Maybe what you need is peace. You're so anxious about all the things that are happening, all the things that are outside of your control, all the, all the things that you read on the news, things worry you. You're just all constantly thinking and wrestling and trying to control things. And what the Lord needs to say to you this year is, you, I need to reset your peace. I need you to just trust the fact that I'm sovereign. And you can't control everything, no matter how hard you want to. And what you need to be able to do is wake up in the morning and just open your hands before God and say, this is your day, God. I will live at peace. Peace with you, 
peace with my neighbor, peace with my family member that's annoying me. I'll live at peace because peace is a fruit of the Spirit. And that's a mark of your repentance. Maybe you're easily irritated. And what you need is patience. You probably don't want to go out to the mall to practice this initially. You probably don't want to get on the freeway to practice this initially. You may want to take some baby steps in this direction. Because you're an impatient person and what you need to learn is patience. Because patience is a fruit of the Spirit and a fruit of your repentance. What would it look like for you this year to say, God, I want to be kind. I want to be more kind. I'm going to think about others rather than myself. I'm going to write notes, send letters, be an encourager. That's going to be my goal this year. God, I want to allow the fruit of the Spirit to change me in such a way that I'm going to be kind this year. God, reset me in the area of kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. You understand what I'm talking about here. This is what it looks like for God to reset us that our lives would actually be evidence of the Holy Spirit moving in us, not us controlling how things go. And so when you think about 2023 and you think about goals, you think about resolutions, you think about resets, what I'm not asking you to do is to be the person who works yourself to the bone in order to accomplish the things that you think you need to get done. Rather, what I'm asking you to do is to allow yourself to be connected to Jesus in such a deep way that what naturally comes out of you are the fruits of the Spirit that you are a blessing to the people around you because you are connected to Jesus. Wouldn't it be amazing for us as a church, for our families, for our marriages, for our relationships, for our parenting, for our work relationships to be so invested with the fruit of the Spirit that we are an uncommonly loving Joyful, peaceful, patient, kind, gentle, self-controlled people. Wouldn't that be awesome? I am praying that in my own life this year, and I'm praying that in yours as well. And so I'm going to ask you, if you would, to bow your heads and to close your eyes. And I'm going to ask you to respond, not by standing, not by raising your hand even, but just by making eye contact with me. And this is not because I am the person who needs to hold you accountable to anything, but because in seeing your eyes, I want to be able to pray for you. If it is your desire to grow in an area where fruitfulness is evidenced in your life in 2023, connection to the Spirit of God through the work of Jesus, that you desire for that to be true in your life, just look at me. I'm just gonna, I'm gonna work my way across the room and I'm gonna try to make eye contact with people so that I can just nod my head towards you and say, yes, I wanna pray for you this year. Yes, I wanna pray for you this year that God's spirit would be evident in your life in such a way that you are a blessing in this world, in your home, in your workplace, because you desire to see the spirit of God at work in you. Because you desire to be a person who is intimately connected to Jesus that you want to change some things in your life, that you want him to reset some things. This is not your effort. This is not your doing. This is him working in you. I want to pray for you. I want you to pray for me. Those of you that looked up, I want you to pray for me this year, that the fruit of the Spirit would be evident in my life that I would be a different person this year as a result of my connection to Jesus. Pray for me. I don't have all of the answers in this, but Jesus is the one who can work his changes in us. 
God, by your Holy Spirit and according to your will, would you move in our church? Would you make us a different people? God, would you allow us to not come before you with all of our preconceptions and all of our ideas and all of our agendas, but rather would we come before you as a people who just desperately want to be connected to Jesus, who desperately want to know what it looks like to actually have our lives changed by him. Would you do that for us this year by resetting our souls? We pray in your name. Amen. It's a great opportunity that we have this next year to really connect our lives to Jesus. I want to invite you to do that. If you are somehow disconnected or you're not yet connected or you've become disconnected, just allow this to be a time of resetting for yourself. Um, Let's walk together as a church family. Let's hold one another accountable. Let's pray for each other. Let's point each other to Jesus this year. Let's see him work his will, not us drive our agenda And let's give him the glory every step of the way. Amen? Amen. Stand with me if you would. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord cause his face to shine upon you, be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance among you and give you his peace. God bless you. Have a great day and happy new year.